Do you enjoy Dungeons and Dragons, video games, role playing games, comic books, science fiction, fantasy, and movies? Check out Point of Insanity Network, where we bring you the Geekery in General podcast, where we will discuss a variety of topics of geek interest. We also offer Gamer's Gambit, a monthly look at current events and trends in the video game industry. If martial arts are your thing, check out The Casual Martial Artist, where we discuss topics of interest to the martial artist as well as people who just enjoy martial arts. Find us at poigamestudio.podbean.com. Welcome back to Queens of the Damned, a horror podcast. Today's episode is a special interview about horror in Shakespeare's Macbeth, featuring a couple of the Prenzy players, a local theater troupe who are currently putting up a production of the play. With me, I have director Catherine Bodenbender and actor Aaron E. Sullivan, who plays Macbeth. Thank you guys so much for coming and answering our questions. So the first question is, what would you guys say to a person who listens to this podcast but doesn't think they're all that interested in Shakespeare to get them to go see a production of this play? Well, I think there's just the general why people should see Shakespeare, our Shakespeare especially, as a start, is because although we do a lot of scholarship in order to prepare for our shows, and our shows reflect that if you've done the scholarship... I think if you know Shakespeare, you see how those things are reflected in our work. What we are primarily trying to do always, and it's personally a big goal of mine as a director, to tell a really good story that is interesting. So um, the kind of scholarly sheen and fancy facade that many Shakespeare productions have is something that we're not particularly interested. What we're interested in doing is telling a compelling story and getting people to feel the things that we think Shakespeare, who was a master of gore in his time, (laughs) wanted his audience to feel and how he wanted the audience to react to the show. And Macbeth, there are certainly times where he absolutely wanted the audience to be afraid. So we have... Tried very much, I have tried very much, and our actors have tried very much, our production staff especially, to um, take some text that, if it were done in the way it was done in Shakespeare's time, would not be particularly scary to us, and present it in a way that is, I don't know if it's like heart-stoppingly frightening, but it's definitely creepy, and it definitely um, will instir, sh- I want the audience to feel panicked. And certainly uncomfortable and unnerved. And so I've gone for things that will make a modern audience feel that way, as opposed to, you know, an ancient audience, I guess. <laughs> Aaron, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, th- I think that Macbeth, um, probably more than any other Shakespeare, is is the play about horror. Um, I think that there are, there are many scenes that explore and, I don't know if I want to say present horror, but like, I know the leading up to the murder of Duncan and right after the murder of Duncan, it's kind of the thing I'm going through as Macbeth is the horror of the moment, what he's about to do and what he's just done. Just to piggyback off of that, actually, the next one was tell me a little bit about the supernatural aspects of of Macbeth and how you address them kind of uniquely in this production. I think first, first and foremost, when people think of Macbeth, they think about the witches and these are like, James the first witch trial style witches at least as as it's written um we're not coming with what Kate was saying earlier um that style of witches aren't really terrifying to the modern audience the way they would have been to 
the audience under James the First, who was obsessed with witches. A lot of this play is kind of catered directly to him. <laughs> uh, the king is your patron. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So I, I don't want to give too much away about our witches. Um, they are supernatural. Yes. Um, but we're trying to downplay the supernatural as much as possible. There's the supernatural influence isn't is this okay is that a good look or a bad look no, that's okay <laughs> the supernatural the supernatural does not influence macbeth macbeth makes the decisions that macbeth, macbeth was going to make from go um he uses the witches as an excuse to justify the horrible things that he's doing but the information they give him is all um equivocation um he interprets it one way when it means something very different such as the the marching of Burnham Wood. Um, he's told that he'll never be defeated. No rebellion can ever take him out until Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane Castle. He's like, well, that's impossible. Trees can't move. Um, so when the English force come, they shield themselves with branches from Burnham Wood. So it presents this illusion of the mo- woods moving toward the castle. So you're saying the supernatural doesn't influence Macbeth. Macbeth interprets Correct. the supernatural elements kind of conveniently yeah yeah it it was important to me as a director that Macbeth's decisions be his own I've I've seen a number of really good productions where the witches are very much in control of everything they're able to influence um I've seen where they influence Duncan and his decision to promote Macbeth which is certainly not textually necessary, but was interesting Mm -hmm. for sure. Um, And I think that can be successful, but I think it leaves us actually a significant part of the horror of the story out, the horror of what this one man does and what lives inside of him and how that comes out of him. And if the witches are in control of everything, if the witches can influence people on that level, make them make a decision, Mm -hmm. um, uh, cause something to happen in the physical realm, to, like a, a dagger to appear, or um, it, it, those sorts of things, I think, take away from Macbeth's agency and that aspect of the horror of the show. Um, on the other hand, they're clearly supposed to be frightening, so they need to have some kind of powers and 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 some kind of influence on the world that they're around. So um, we've made a choice... You know, I I thought about many different ways of doing it. There are ways to do the witches where, uh, for instance, I once thought of distilling them down to one person who um, was experiencing psychosis, who heard voices. Um, In my past, I worked in a metaphysical bookstore, a story that I have told a million times, but I I did. And um, we had many people come in who would come to us for spiritual aid for serious mental health issues. People who would come in who were schizophrenic and specifically experiencing like multiple personality disorders and other people who just heard voices. And um, I remember talking to the owner who had once been a social worker and now was uh, did all of her therapy through tarot reading. You know, what do we do when those folks come in? I mean, how can we actually, I don't know how much help I can give them at this desk with my crystals and my books on, on Wicca. Um, and she said, she said to me, well, she, that she, she does, and she showed me where she kept literature and, and phone numbers to help connect those folks with, with actual help. Um, but when I expressed this idea that, sh- that they, you know, clearly the voices were something that they were creating, she looked at me straight in the eye and said, how do you know that? How do you know that people who are schizophrenic and hearing voices aren't actually hearing voices if there's a spiritual realm Mm. i mean it's certainly not helpful to them (laughs) and needs to be you know what can be done to make that stop needs to be done but you we have no idea whether or not they're hearing actual voices and so for a while i strongly considered making the witches one girl who heard actual spirits and so everyone thought she was crazy, but in reality, she was just kind of an unfortunate rece- receptor. Doing that meant that I could cast two less awesome actors, which is the entire reason why I didn't go with it. I wanted to cast as many awesome actors as I could. So I retained the three witches, but I, but I, I also retained the idea of the witches as spirits. And I don't want to say a whole lot more than that, um, but the witches are not on their own corporeal. They are 
somewhat, I've stolen somewhat from stories of um, the Morgan and her attraction and being drawn and presence at battle. So they're spirits that are drawn to battle and they find a way to interact. They find a way to interact with people. And that's <laughs> what um, I think how that happens is a very, is cool and creepy and scary. It's the most scared I've been of which is in Macbeth ever. Yeah, and same. I asked them to do that. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's the idea. Next time I do Macbeth, the Macbeth will straight up be the a mixture of the Morgan and the Ben, the Benet closely related to the Banshee, the washerwoman who foretells people's deaths. But that'll be, I figure, how long has it been since we did Macbeth? 10 years? Maybe 13. 13 years. So in 13 years, wait for it, folks. <laughs> Come to the show. The Morgan will be on full display. <laughs> so, Aaron, you directed Macbeth. I did. 13 years I ago. I did. And then I directed again at Sherrard High School not yes. 13 years ago. So. Yes. And so <laughs> what are some... Can you talk a little bit about those previous productions and how you address them then, just so we can get a sense of like the multiple ways in which you can take a Shakespeare script and do totally different things with it? Um, it's so long ago. It was also <laughs> like the first show that I ever directed, so there was a lot of learning on my feet when I was directing that one. Um, the witches were kind of semi-magical. They They mostly just said things. Um, came out of the audience. They all had um, some kind of tick or attribute that was just kind of unsettling. One was constantly itching um, <laughs> while in the audience, and it kind of like left people unsettled. One girl um, I had, her trait was uh, trigger kleptomania, where she kept pulling out her hair. Um, and she, that actress actually had that for like two weeks after the show. Like oh. she, she found herself pulling out her hair for a while. And when I did it at Sherrard, I kind of went with that and I went a little bit deeper into it. Um, one girl, I have her basically with Tourette's where she was not the swearing Tourette's, but like the, <clears throat> the kind of constant vocal tick. So it was like throwing off the verse. Um, but they were generally just kind of women that were present that that said things they didn't really have a lot of influence i'm also of the opinion of the more power you give to the witches the less you the more you remove free will from macbeth uh, i once saw a production of macbeth where they included hecate uh, which is a scene that's usually cut because she shows up yells at the witches for influencing macbeth or dealing with macbeth without her permission and then has them sing and dance um usually it's believed that <laughs> That was added later to include more spectacle, so it's, it's usually cut. Um, but in this production, they had Hecate, didn't do the singing and dancing, but in the final fight, Macbeth killed Macduff. He was dead. And Hecate was like up on the top of the stage and rose him back to life so Macduff could kill Macbeth. And I was like, well, there was no free will anywhere. Yeah. Like, Macbeth had no choice in the matter. He was always going to kill those people. So it kind of, it absolved him of far too much um, by removing all of his free will, which is what I, what I love about this, this production that we're in right now. It's all on me. And there are many horrible things that I do in the course of this play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think um, the, if a director is really interested in the witches, they're much more likely to have a witches controlling everything, Macbeth. And then the witches will be incredibly cool. Yeah. Like, there's usually their costuming, their tech. I mean, those kinds of productions are often visually and aurally stunning. But I, I think it does take away from what's really cool about the story. Also, we don't have that budget. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think also so there's that. There's, you know, like, maybe in... Maybe in 13 years, we'll have a million dollars and we'll actually have the freaking Morgan flying as a crow and turn into a person. Entirely possible. But we don't have that kind of budget now. One of the things I think is absolutely, is the most horrifying about this play. It is, it is the path of two decent people, not necessarily good people, but decent people descending into mass murder and madness and breaking apart like they are they function as a unit i think that it's 
actually, before all this happened, before the events of the play began, I think that they were a healthy, loving couple. And then this was presented to them. Macbeth tries to get out of it first, and Lady Macbeth brings him back. Lady Macbeth then tries to get out of it, and then Macbeth brings her back. So they, they kind of bring out the worst in each other, and it drives them apart and drives them mad. Um, and I think that one of the things that I keep coming back to this play is that potential lives in everyone. I believe that given the right pressure and circumstances, anybody is capable of anything, which is terrifying. <laughs> I mean, either for good or for bad, with, you know, for good, less terrifying, but under the right circumstances, you could end up killing somebody. Yeah. I think as actors, we become very aware of all the, in order to access all these characters that we have to play, some devils, some angels, almost all of them a mixture of the two. We become aware that in order to access them, we have to look for seeds inside ourselves. And I think that that's true even if you're not particularly method, you know, even if you're not directly, you don't have to directly pull from your experience for the fullness of it but to have you find a touchstone you find a way in inside yourself and that depending on the kind of roles that you've played can kind of be terrifying because um you know and love yourself and you know that you yourself are trying to do i mean i hope i think yeah, Aaron, I, yeah, I, I try it is to do my good. experience i have known you for a long time 16, 17 years, and I see, think you mostly are trying to do good. But that is my goal. Um, yeah, mine too. <laughs> mine too. Um, I don't always succeed, and, and that's just the way of it. But um, you, you realize and you think of what can be lurking inside anyone else all around you is that potential for the horrific, just like there's the potential for the heroic. And um, it makes taking on roles like Macbeth or Lady Macbeth I think for us, there is a something of a personal cost for a time to let those things live inside of you. I know that I felt that very much when I played Lear. Um, that was not a, a fun, there was a lot of not fun place to be with Lear. And uh, I always wanted to pay, play Lady Macbeth to Aaron's Macbeth. And now I find that I'm quite happy to direct. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking just because, so I stage managed when we did Titus Andronicus, and I was thinking about the horror of finding those seeds of those things that live inside you. Even as a witness to that, it was horrifying to me to see so much pain and horror going on in that, like, in that play. It was just like... It was hard to watch, but, like, in a really good way. <laughs> at, at the end of it, I was very glad to be rid of that horrible old man. Yeah. Like, yeah. Because Aaron was tight. Oh, he's, so Aaron has played a few <laughs> interesting individuals. Um, and a couple boring ones. No. <laughs> That's not true. Not true at not all. True. Even if they were written boring, he played them interesting. <laughs> so he was Titus. He was, he played Faust. <laughs> so he has... Iago? Iago. Oh, yeah. Ooh, There's so, some that I wasn't even there for. That's interesting. Um, How does Iago compare to Macbeth? Like, as far as somebody inside your head. Um, there With Iago, um, because there were so many... Um, he had to be so many different people to so many different people. To play that convincingly, there was nothing going on inside. Um, Iago was empty and one of one of my proudest moments um, my wife Jill when she came to see it there was a scene where Iago is comforting comforting Desdemona having just told Othello to strangle her in her bed and when Jill came to see it her thought was everything's going to be okay Iago said everything's going to be okay oh god <laughs> like like that was that was horrifying in its own way, like that emptiness, like there was no soul to Iago. There was no underpinning to what he was doing. He was just reacting. He had this goal um, to destroy uh, Othello and Desdemona, and everything else was just kind of 
well-painted veneer on top of it. Macbeth is the opposite. Like, Macbeth is filled with reasons. Um, he's probably one of the most imaginative characters in the canon, um, up there with Hamlet. Maybe even a little bit more imaginative than Hamlet. Like, the, the, the imagery that he invokes when he's discussing whether or not to kill the king and the discussion of the dagger. There's just these vivid, bright pictures that he paints with his words about what he thinks about things. But he's a much more feeling character than a thinking character like Hamlet. So there's all of this going on inside. Um, as the play progresses, it that all becomes paired away. And he just becomes this driving force of destruction for his own good. Even getting to the point where he doesn't even want to exist anymore. And it's not even necessarily in a suicidal way, but in like, I, I don't want there to be the sun. I begin to be a weary of the sun. And would the estate of the world were now undone. He wants everything to stop. So, that's fun. So, so... Come up with some aftercare. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, have you provided your actors with, say, like, 20 milligrams of Prozac? <laughs> so, it's fair to say, maybe, that you've developed some empathy for Macbeth? Or, like, how do you... How does Aaron stand in relation to Macbeth? Um... I would hope to say that I understand him. I don't pity him or feel bad for him because of the horrible, horrible things he does. But, like, finding the reasoning for it has been interesting. I think one of the things that I bring to this is there's such insistence on the sleeplessness. Um, and I've suffered with insomnia for my entire life. Um, it's a family trait. My brothers and sisters and my grandmother and my father all have... Like, they, we all get by on very little sleep. Um, so that feeling of exhaustion is something I know really well. You know, there, there are days, there's a code word in my family, like with, with Jill and Henry, I'm like, I am Macbeth tired today. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's pretty damn tired. That's pretty tired. <laughs> um, and you, you do make worse decisions when you haven't slept. And when I was preparing for it, um, this time, even before we started getting into rehearsals, I was kind of running through the timeline, getting ready, and realizing that when we see him, it's probably been a while since he slept. Because, um, like, first we see him in the battle, and then that night he kills Duncan, yeah. and he doesn't really sleep after that. So he is playing most of the play exhausted. Um, which I'm not stating as like an excuse, but like you make worse decisions and then he just keeps making bad decisions throughout. So I don't know if I would say empathy, but I, I get it. And, and, and as we had said earlier, there is that, that self-discovery, that finding the seeds within yourself that could lead to such horrible decisions. There's also a benefit to that. It isn't all like, um, actor suffering doing that work to understand how you would get to that place, I think helps you not get to that place. Um, it's I'm, a kind of therapy. Yeah. For those of us, I mean, for those of us who do it, it's definitely a kind of therapy. And, and so is, and so is directing, you know, I mean, that's, I think, I mean, of course, m most artistic expressions are, in some, you know, they're reflecting what they may be reflecting what's happening in the world, but they're they're playing out on how that has resonated with the artist's soul. So, and when you're in a theater, there's a lot of artists, and it's all bouncing off all of us. So it's nothing is ever one person's creation, but all of us get caught up in what can be really healing work. But uh, but but sometimes, I mean, you definitely have to explore the wound. You have to explore the dark places in order to be able. To come to groups with them and so there's a there's that aspect of it as well that uh, specifically for me i think about gender and gender expression in terms of that because of the way we do shakespeare we have um every we've had men play women play men men play women um women play men's roles as females men play women's roles as men and um the way that we all get to explore um, and take on different kinds of gender expressions in that way, I think, 
has made us in general a better and healthier group of people, <laughs> you yeah. know, with, with lots of access to different parts of our our personalities and, and psyches that way. So I do think that, it, yeah, there's it, it hurts, but there's also a benefit for sure. With this production, you have cast women in men's roles as women and vice versa? Mm. Um, in this production, well, yes. Actually, we have examples of both. Yeah. Um, although, well, I don't know if the witches are. The witches refer to each other as sisters, so they identify as female. And we have a man who is playing one of them. Jake Walker is playing the third witch. And then um, my sister Elizabeth Woolley is playing Angus, who's a thane. And there's nothing changed about... We haven't changed Angus at all, except that Angus is a woman. Um, in our Scotland, in the Scotland of our imaginations, <laughs> um, men and women inhabit both of those inhabit roles equally so um and our female angus is just the same of angus as just as much as anybody else as, as if she were a man how does that or does it um change the dynamics between the characters in macbeth or some of the characters i think that one of the things that has come about uh, partially because of that decision and honestly partially because We've, um, all the men in our uh, company have had to explore what would be stereotypically referred to as their feminine side, right? Um, <laughs> and that what and women have had to explore their more masculine side. Um, there's this blending um, um, in, when Scotland is healthy, there's this, at the beginning of the play, there's this blending of the masculine, what are typically masculine and feminine traits. All of the warriors are great huggers. All of the warriors, when confronted with a death, weep and comfort one another. Because in the Scotland of our, of this play, all of those things are healthily met and, and dealt with. And it doesn't take away because they're all parts of life. There's living, dying, fighting, bucking, eating. That's what's important in, in our Scotland. And everybody partakes of those things equally. So death is just a part of the culture that everyone who is mourning openly mourns. And that's, that's not a gendered experience. It does make for an opportunity, um, which is, it's not a huge point in the play, but we, but because we have female thanes, we are able to make like Lady Macbeth, where we've decided that she, the reason that she is not at the battle, Lady Macbeth and Lady Macduff are not at the battle in the beginning of the play, the hurly burly that the witches talk about, because they are expecting children. Otherwise, they would simply be, they would be fighting as well. Um, so when everybody comes down in arms because the alarm bell's rung because Duncan is killed, Lady Macbeth is also carrying a sword ready to do battle. So, and that's, I think that's more fun for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it also sort of matters what historical context you put it in as well. I Did you set this one in the present or is this like... I would say all my plays are set in no time. In no time. I, no time, okay. no place. We honestly, I'm a little bit of a stickler. If you're going to set some place things somewhere at some time, and we don't have the budget for it, and it allow and this allows us some flexibility um, to be a little anachronistic without being, you know, without having to commit totally to being in the present. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good decision because you don't have to um, say that this is relevant particularly to one time or one place, it, it kind of transcends all because it's, it's Shakespeare. So I don't know if this is one we already kind of addressed because this is like the vaguest question that I have, which is what is the darkest aspect of this play to you? What is the thing in essence about Macbeth that is the hardest to grapple with? One of the things I'm I've been running through my head and getting ready for this is after killing Duncan, Macbeth panics. Panic may not be the right word, but he freezes up might be better. He accidentally brings the daggers 
that they were he was supposed to leave with the servants to make it look like they killed Duncan, he brings them with him, and Lady Macbeth tells him to take them back, and he won't go. But this is a man whose livelihood is on the battlefield. He's described as unseeming someone from the nave to the chaps, basically splitting them open like a hog and cutting their head off. Gore and blood is not unusual for him. What was it about killing Duncan that he can't go back to? And I feel like he didn't just stab Duncan a couple of times. The number I throw out to everyone else, like the people that see the Duncan's body, is like, imagine 40 to 60 stab wounds. Like, when he started attacking Duncan, he couldn't stop. And I think that's that realization that he's not in control of himself at certain instances. Like, he has a directionality about it in battle, but when he gives in to violence, he loses control. That's that's something that's really dark for me in this. And I think that eventually leads to, and without giving too much away, the slaughter of Macduff's family. He decides that Macduff is a threat, so he's going to seize upon his castle. Um, having found out Macduff has left, he continues with the plan, and there's no one in the castle but women, children, and servants. And he wants all of them killed, which is horrific. Like they, I mean, in our production, they have the means to defend themselves because in our Scotland, everyone fights. But they're still met with enough of an overwhelming force, and Our Lady Macduff is pregnant, and he still wants them all wiped out. That that's a dark and horrible play. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would say that. Um, there's a possibility for the play beginning with the loss of a child. Lady Macduff has many um, things that she she refers to this lost child. Um, Lady Macbeth. <clears throat> Lady Macbeth, pardon me. <clears throat> refers to this lost child. <clears throat> In our production, the loss of the child is incredibly close. She is still, she is not yet, her breasts have not yet stopped producing milk. So when she asks the murdering ministers to take her milk for gall, it's because she's still... She still has it. So there's that initial loss of a child, and then there's the attempted murder of Flance, and then there's the murder of um, Macduff's children. And so, I, I mean, I think for me, definitely the, um, the murder of children is the, is the darkest and most difficult part of this play for me personally, um, as a mother and as someone who um, lost a child to stillbirth. That is, it's hard. I like, again, I told them to do that, and <laughs> it's still quite hard. Right. We don't have to end with that because I do have one more question. Awesome. So, um, so we like to talk a lot on this podcast about cultural quirks and traditions. And for listeners who might not know, there's this long-held superstition surrounding Macbeth, which is if you say its name or quote it in a theater, except as part of the actual production it will cause disaster. So, why do you think this is? Is this, there? I know there's probably an official story behind it, but I mean culturally, why do you think this is? Why this play? What's up with it? For starters, I don't think that there's a curse. Um, yeah, I say Macbeth all the time. Yeah, sometimes I do it just to get those other actors that freak out about it to freak out about <clears> it. <throat> yeah. um, this is the sixth production I've been in, and I have not noticed any more mishaps injuries or accidents in Macbeth's than the other plays I've done. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I didn't ask you, do you believe in it? Because I kind of figured both of you would think it was bullshit. Yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's interesting as I think it's one of those it's an example that's actually presented in the play. The thing only has as much power as you give it. The witches only have as much power as you give them and I think Part of what feeds this Macbeth curse is people are willing to give the idea of this play being cursed a lot of power. So then they start to see mishaps and accidents around it. I'm not entirely sure where that got started. I do know. I know I know of what I've read um, about where it got started. I think part of the reason, I mean, clearly it's not associated with why it started anymore at all, because most people don't know how it started, but um, I think it perpetuates 
largely because of the characters of the witches. And honestly, actors are kind of superstitious folks. They really can be, like athletes, you know? <laughs> That's very true. You know? Um, but, uh, you know, I think that the presence of the witches and them saying, you know, they, their words have power, their words affect Macbeth, and then those things do happen, just in not the way he's expecting. So the use of the name of the play can create something you don't expect to have something negative that you didn't expect to happen. Um, I think that's probably why it persists. I know that it started because um, used to be back in the day, uh, very oftentimes the producer, there was a period of time where the, sh the show would go up um, and there would be a producer go up in a new town There'd be a, the, and the producer would play Duncan. And after Duncan's death on the final night, he would steal all of the money that was made and abscond. <laughs> And so that's where the curse comes from. That's the idea that the play is cursed with thieving producers who insist on playing Duncan. So that's where it began. When they said disaster, I was thinking like more Phantom of the Opera than like... I think that's what people think now. But embezzlement? That's, yeah, but that's where it came from. The disaster was that nobody got paid. Uh, but Which, yeah, that's... I mean, that's, that's a disaster. That's, that's, that's a real a disaster. bad. disaster. It doesn't feel like a supernatural disaster, but... No. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to know that. I was just curious about that. It's kind of hard to talk about Macbeth without mentioning that on a supernatural Yeah, podcast. and I, I always tell people that I consider myself to be quite spiritually powerful, and if there is any curse, I'm certainly stronger than it. <laughs> yes, of course. It's going to be a really fun, scary exciting production fight filled it's show. there are so many fights there are so many fights and fights are thrilling to me in the way near unto the thrill of a horror there's one that i'm thinking of that i'm not going to tell because it's a total spoiler but it is every time it happens my oh, my whole me just shrivels up <laughs> in like shock and and like disgust and fear and fascination and excitement it's ooh, I can't wait. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And I, I warned you about it. Like right. I knew it was coming. <laughs> and it every time still. It's always still kind of thrilling to me because people can get hurt while doing it, even though you're not using like sharp no. weapons. But people I know that people have gotten hurt and every time you watch them do the fight, it's like, Oh please. Just right. come or come away with like both eyeballs. <laughs> never pass the sword past never, somebody's face. Oh, never, never by the face. Never by the face. Nope. We do fight. They do fight quite close to the audience in this show. So Ooh, that's, I love it. <laughs> that's an additional thrill. They're they're quite close to the audience, and the audience is fairly exposed. Do you use blood in this play? We're going to just use it on the hands for. Okay. Um, there are two times that there'll be blood on hands, where the place where you expect it, and then a place where you don't. Okay, so this is really important. What are the show dates and where can people make reservations and contact you and all that good stuff? We open on the 18th of January um, and we run the 18th and 19th, both at 8 o'clock are the show times. The box office opens at 7 and the space opens at 7.30. Um, on the 20th, which is a Sunday, we, um, we have a show at 3 and the box office opens at 2.00. Then we have a performance actually on Tuesday, the 22nd. That one's also at 8, with the box office opening at 7. And then we have performances Thursday, the 24th, Thursday, uh, Friday, the 25th, and Saturday, the 26th, all at 8 o'clock, with, um, with the box office opening at 7. You can make reservations at, um, we have a Google Doc where you can make reservations online, and you can get there by going to our website, which is prenzyplayers.com. Um, you can also um, reserve by emailing us um, at prenzyplayers at gmail.com. So that's how to get to us. Seats are very limited. We are seating just over 30 people per show. It's a very intimate show. So make reservations. And know that um, if you may not get your first choice of date, um, so let us know. Choose more than one and let us know your preference. Okay. And what's the location? Um, we're up by the seven point, or no, by the five points area. Make me sound smart. It's at 1731 Wilkes Avenue in Davenport, just off of Division. 
um, at the school that houses the um, massage. The Institute of Therapeutic Massage. Institute of Therapeutic Massage um, in that old school there by five points. Okay. Well, thank you so much, guys. Any closing thoughts, ponderings? Nope. Thanks for having Questions. us. Questions? Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm so excited. <laughs> I just reserved my tickets, and I'm glad I did because I know it's going to sell out really quick. Yeah. So. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter at QOTD Podcast, on Facebook at facebook.com slash QOTD Podcast, Tumblr at queensofthedampodcast.tumblr.com, and YouTube at Queens of the Dam Podcast. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and TuneIn Radio. You can also follow us on our blog, queensofthedampodcast.wordpress.com, to find bonus content and extra information on our episodes. If you would like to donate to our show, you can find us at patreon.com slash qotdpodcast, where you can receive special perks as a listener for becoming a monthly patron. If you would like to make a one-time donation, you can send it to qotdpodcast at gmail.com on PayPal. We'll see you next week. I was thinking about the fighting close to the audience and I was thinking yeah. about the time when Bobby and I filled oh. the blood bags too full for Titus and my mom got uh, <laughs> splashed. I imagine that some people would hate that. I would love it. If I went to a show and I got covered in blood, I'd be like, oh, the, yes. The-